Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Kalanadi. Today I'm going to wrap up all the books that I read for The Reading Rush, which ran from July 22nd to July 28th. There were seven reading challenges, I completed all of them. I also read seven books, which is what I usually do for this readathon, which is formerly called Booktubeathon. Um, so I'm going to talk about those books. Filming today is not the most pleasant thing. I'm already hot and sweaty and I'm either sneezing or coughing because my allergies absolutely hate me right now. Uh, so I want to get this over with as quickly as possible so I can go sit in bed and crochet in front of my fan. First, for the challenges, read a book in one place and read a book with a non-human protagonist. I read Rogue Protocol and Exit Strategy by Martha Wells. This is my first time rereading both of these novellas, which are the third and fourth in the Murderbot series, and I really, really enjoyed rereading these. Shocking absolutely nobody because I love the Murderbot series so much. Um, Rogue Protocol has always been my least favorite out of the novellas, not because it's bad, I still love it, but it's the one I would rank fourth if you were forcing me to rank the novellas. Um, but actually I felt like I got a lot more out of this one upon rereading it. I noticed some things that I just hadn't picked up on so much the first time around. So in this one, Murderbot decides to go investigate a Grey Chris terraforming station that is being decommissioned and is shortly going to fall into the planet and be destroyed. But Murderbot thinks that it's going to find evidence there that Grey Chris has been dealing illegally with alien civilization remnants, and it wants to take evidence of that and send it back to the ongoing um, legal fight between Preservation Ox and and Grey Chris, which is where this whole story began. When Murderbot gets to the station, it kind of attaches itself to the group of humans who are going in to like evaluate the situation and you know shut it down. And those humans have a robot with them that they treat like a person that they're very affectionate towards. That robot is much less sophisticated than Murderbot. Um, it doesn't have any organic parts, it's not as intelligent, but they do treat it with a lot of affection like they really care for it. And the thing I noticed this time around is how appalled Murderbot is by that situation and what eventually happens to that robot, how that affects Murderbot. And I just didn't remember that from reading the book the first time and I felt like that was a really important thing to pick up on because it's feeding into how Murderbot feels about its own relationships with humans and in particular the human that technically in the eyes of the law, owns it. And then after that, um, with Exit Strategy, this is the one where um, Grey Chris gets wind of Murderbot going to the station and they panic and they kidnap Dr. Mensa. When Murderbot hears of this, it drops everything to rush back and try to help rescue Dr. Mensa, and in that process has to confront the humans that it had abruptly left from the first novella and kind of face its place, like what it wants to do with its life. Can it go back and live in the situation that it's been given in Preservation Ox? And all the feels, I got to the end of this and once again I just felt bereft because I had no more murder but this is the only universe that I've ever gone off and read fan fiction in when I was done with the books that are currently out because I just need more and the novel isn't coming out until May of 2020 and that's just so so long to wait and there's some quite good fan fiction out there if you're trying to scratch that murder bot itch so super glad that I made time to reread both of these I love this series as I keep saying I really feel for murder bot um, I really sympathize with its feelings of anxiety and not necessarily knowing what it wants to be or what it wants to do with its life. Just, that's, it's such a great character. I'm so glad that Martha Wells had this idea. I'm talking about these books in kind of random order, not in the order in which I read them because 
I can't remember <laughs> the order in which I read them. Um, so I think that I'm going to continue with the other books that I reread because four of the seven books that I read were rereads actually. So the one big disappointment of the readathon for me was rereading The Beginning Place by Ursula K. Le Guin. I have finally read something by Le Guin that I did not like. This is not her best work. It's not her best novel and I did not enjoy it. Um, it's still written well just on the prose level. It has that magic of Le Guin's writing. She's just so masterful but character-wise, plot-wise, with the world building, this was a huge disappointment. The entire thing felt kind of hateful, depressed, and blurrily confusing. So it's the story of a man and a woman who independently discover this place that they call the beginning place, which is a kind of gateway into another world. So it's kind of a contemporary fantasy because most of it is set in like 1980 America, which is when the book was published. Um, and then the world that they go to is a more historical feel and time runs very differently in that like little pocket universe type of thing. Um, both of these people, the woman who's been going to this place for years and then the man who has just discovered it, um, see this place as an escape. They both have really horrible, claustrophobic, suffocating lives at home with their families. They have a lot of reasons to just run away as far as they can. And so they're really drawn to this place this place kind of outside of time that is just nature, unconnected from the world, unconnected from any of their problems. But when they encounter each other, they just immediately don't like each other. The woman in particular is really hateful towards the man. I think it's pretty easy to see why she's riled up about him because he's a stranger. He's and he's the person who has walked into her sanctuary, basically. It's, it's her place, but he's taking it away from her. That's kind of how she sees it. But I don't think that is excused or explained necessarily all of her behavior towards him. She's just immediately really nasty to him when she thinks about him, when she talks to him. And I was really bothered by that. The man is... He just comes across as kind of this blank slate who's very confused, but he just pushes on forward even though he doesn't understand what's going on. He's very self-centered in that way. He doesn't necessarily seem to care about understanding what other people are doing or what's going on. He's just on his own little adventure. Um, but anyway, the part of the book that actually was most disappointing to me is that the setting in this like fantasy world is not fleshed out at all. There's this vague sense that something terrible is happening there. There's something that's threatening the existence of this world. But the people who live there won't tell the man or the woman what the problem is. Either they can't tell what it is or they won't, which is incredibly frustrating. And even though the woman has been going there for years and offers to help, they basically won't let her help. They choose the man instead. Like he just walks in and he's immediately the chosen one. And he's like, all right, whatever. They end up having to go on this little quest together to fix the problem. But I have no idea what the problem actually was, how they fixed it, or if they even fixed it. And then, even though they haven't liked each other for the entire book, they suddenly randomly get together, have sex, like each other, and then walk off to back to the real world or whatever. And I was just... I was done at that point. Um, I have nothing more to say about this. Not a book I would recommend. Anything else by Le Guin is a better thing than this. The other book that I reread was Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I listened to this on audiobook and it was a lot of fun. It was very sweet, but it was also not as amazing as I had remembered it being from when I was a kid. I have very vague memories of this, but I think I went through one of those like obsessive phases with Little Women. I clearly had read the book, my parents bought me a bunch of her books, and then I'd watched the movie enough to have it imprinted on me. I started listening to the audiobook and just my memories of the 94 movie adaptation came flooding back, like entire scenes that I'd remembered. And I was like, wow, I must have, 
I must have watched this more times than I remembered. Um, so yeah, it was it was really fun. It was really sweet. The thing that I hadn't remembered about it is that it is very, very obviously on the nose about being moralistic and a tale for children to make them better, you know? It's kind of pedantic. And it's, it's probably not as obvious when you're reading it as a kid, but as an adult, I can see the author pulling the strings behind the scenes, you know? Um, and that bugged me a little bit. Um, it's also much more episodic, which I hadn't remembered make, makes absolute sense given the time that it was published and the fact that it was probably serialized in a newspaper or a women's journal of some type. Um, every chapter is its own little installment, kind of a self-contained story and moral and all of that. Um, but since this was published in, what, 1868? That's not atypical for fiction of the time at all as far as I know. So. Yeah, I really enjoyed rereading it. I'm really glad I listened to it as an audiobook. That was a really good way to experience the story. And I read this one for the challenge of read a book and watch its movie adaptation. And I rewatched the 94 movie adaptation and it was so good. My only real thoughts on that were kind of the disappointments. One is that I don't like Laurie in the movie. He comes across as more boyish and innocent and going through his own problems in the book. Whereas in the movie, I thought that Christian Bale was obviously too old and his he played the character as more of a jerk, <laughs> especially that scene where he meets Meg at the party where she lets her friends dress her up and she's very much not herself. In the book, Laurie does kind of take her to task for that. He then apologizes for being so blunt about it, let's say, not very nice about it. And that same kind of thing happens in the movie, but I thought that Laurie was much more of a jerk and a bore about it and didn't apologize as nicely. And I just took an instant dislike to his character after that point. The other thing that I noticed that they changed is they basically excised everything about Beth's friendship with Mr. Lawrence, who is Laurie's grandfather. And that really cut everything about kind of the, almost like the redemption of Mr. Lawrence's character and a lot about how the family views Beth and how sweet and innocent and stay at home she is, but what her own joy is, which is music. In the book, she slowly befriends Mr. Lawrence, who invites her over to his house to play on his piano, and he comes to really enjoy her music. Um, he mentions that he had a daughter who, who died very young, who also enjoyed music, and he kind of, I think he kind of sees Beth as a stand-in daughter in a, in a very loving way. And then of course he gives the family a piano for Beth to play. And there are parts of that in the movie, but they basically cut any of the interactions between Beth and Mr. Lawrence. And so it, it just felt to me like Beth was there to die and not necessarily to really show her as part of the core of the family and how, like she's, she's a very quiet, but important presence in the book. She is so important to everybody, but it didn't really come across in the movie version as much. So yeah, I enjoyed rereading that. I don't think I'll reread Little Men, but I'm glad I finally reread Little Women. Allergies are still kicking my butt so much. I'm trying not to sneeze in between talking about books. For the challenge of read a book with purple on the cover, I read Luna Wolf Moon by Anne MacDonald. This is the second book in the Luna series, which is about um, the Corta family on the moon. There are five major families that control most of the politics and economic industries on the moon in this. Um, the Cortas are basically at war with the Mackenzie family. In the first book, New Moon, um, that rivalry um, came to a head and the Mackenzies attacked the Cortas. It was very catastrophic and lots of people died. And it follows the surviving members of the Corta family, many of whom are children of the major characters from the first book, actually. So some of them are very young. Um, and it basically 
follows them, like where did they end up, how are they surviving, where did they go to ground, or who is held hostage by which families basically, and how they're dealing with this and if any of them have plans to fight back and try to regain the power that the Corta family had before. The one who is most intent on reclaiming their former status is Luca. He's the only character who actually isn't on the moon anymore. So to go into too much detail would probably be lots of spoilers, but I thought that the atmosphere and the intensity, the setting of this book was just as good as the first one. Um, McDonald is so good at description, at bringing the feeling of a place alive, and just the way that he describes the settings on the moon and everything, it's fantastic. Um, however, this started to really fail me in terms of character development, and there was something at the end that I was just infuriated by, which is not about the story itself, but about the way that I think McDonald chose to write the story. So I'll address the characters first. There are many characters in this series, and I don't remember from the first book thinking that they were done poorly. Um, but I, I just think that the story was so rushed that it kind of just whipped on past telling you who these people were and how they were developing. Um, I don't know. It just didn't work for me very well. And I think maybe part of my problem with it is that these characters are all very isolated from each other and they don't particularly like each other or have friendships. So even though they all belong to the Corda family, they aren't really necessarily loyal to each other or attempting to help each other. And I find that very disappointing for any story about family where the family doesn't actually care about each other as individuals, but more so is only loyal to the idea of the family as a whole. That really bothers me, especially when children are involved. And like I said, some of the characters in this, some of the surviving people are very young and all their, their relatives are dead, their parents are dead and stuff. Um, so I got to the end and just thought that I didn't know any of these people any better and I didn't necessarily feel like everything they had been through was really changing them as people either. But the thing that really ended up making me rate this three stars instead of four stars like I wanted to is that um, all the characters have their own point of view in their storylines, all of them, all the survivors, including Luca Corta. But there is something from his storyline that I think that McDonald intentionally withholds from you in order to make some events of the book more shocking to keep you from guessing what's going on. And it just seemed so weird to me because if you just taken out all of Luca's storyline entirely, that would have made much more sense to me. He's the one character who isn't on the moon, so it could easily have been written as just the people who are on the moon and they, they already think he's dead, um, and then bring his storyline in in the third and final book to really hammer home what's been going on. But instead, it's like, the author chooses to make you think that you know what Luca's been doing and then comes in at the very end and says, nope, I've been withholding all this information from you so you couldn't guess. And I, it just really bugged me. I was so irritated by that, perhaps more than I should have been. So I didn't like that so much. Um, definitely New Moon was a better book in my opinion, but I'm still excited to read the third and final book. I really, really want to know what the conclusion of all of this is. The other two books that I read for the readathon though were really good and I really enjoyed them. So next is Of Love and Other Monsters by Vandana Singh. I read this one for the challenge of read a book with five or more words in the title. I was gonna read The Stone and the Skull by Elizabeth Bear but I ended up not having enough time to finish that one, so I read this novella instead. It, it arrived in the mail in the middle of the readathon. I love Vandana Singh's short fiction. She's only written short fiction, like short stories and novellas. She doesn't have any novels out, but I don't think I've been disappointed by any of her stories so far, and I've read two of her collections and two of her novellas that are in this Conversation Pieces line from um, Aqueduct Press. 
So this one is about um, a man in India who has no memory of his prior life. Um, he was rescued from a fire by a woman who says that he, he lost all of his things and all of his memories in the fire. She takes him in, he relearns how to be a person basically, and then over the course of his life he gets these hints that this woman has not been completely honest with him about his origins, about who she is. This man is, to not really spoil things, but to kind of explain this a bit better, he thinks he's an alien, and he may be an alien. He has this ability to kind of sense other people's minds, and, and sometimes he can even like bring minds together in like a meta mind, like a mob mentality or like group think. Um, so he's always aware of like the, the texture, the cacophony of voices, and what other people's minds are like around him. And he is being pursued by this mysterious stranger bent on evil purposes perhaps, who has the same ability but can use it to basically mind control people against their will. But the protagonist has no idea why he's really being pursued and if he can do anything about it. And then he starts to uncover more and more of what he actually is. I feel like I'm not explaining what this is about very well, but I really, really liked it. Um, most of the stories I read by Singh, including this one, feature Indian characters either living in India or emigrated to other countries. And even if it's science fiction set on another planet, they're often um, descendants of people from India, from that culture, from that tradition and everything. And there's something about that I just love. It's not your more standard Western-based SFF. So really enjoyed that. Um, what else can I say about this? It was just really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, the other novella she has in this line is called Distances, which is more based on mathematics, I think. Um, has a less fantastical feel than this one does, but I would call both of them science fiction, definitely. The last book that I read was another substitute from my original TBR. I was going to read The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wells Wallace for the challenge of read an author's first book, but when I was getting ready to sit down and read that, I was feeling really bummed out by some family news already, and I thought I probably shouldn't read a really depressing and upsetting book about climate change while I'm in this mood. So. I picked up a different book instead, and that is In the Forest of Forgetting by Theodora Goss. Uh, this was her first book. It was published like 10 years before she started writing novels, and it's a collection of short stories. And man, this was a really good short story collection. Um, I've read some of Goss's newer short stories, and I've liked them, but I think I prefer the ones in this more than anything I've read by her recently. I don't think that any of these stories are straight up fairy tale retellings, but they feel like they are. Um, I want to say that Goss has actually studied fairy tales or folk tales. I get the sense that she just knows a lot of these traditional tales, storytelling, um, culture from many places. She is originally from Hungary, I want to say, from Budapest. Um, she's lived in other places as well and is now in the U.S. And I could get the sense of that in a lot of these stories. And once again, I really, really enjoyed that, much like I really enjoy the Indian culture and Indian characters from Vandana Singh's books. Um, but they really did feel like almost modern fairy tales. I didn't mark any of the ones that I particularly liked, so let's see if I can remember. Miss Emily Grey was one that I really liked. Um, one of those that has a great ending to it. Um, be careful what you wish for, basically. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at this list and thinking, I liked all of these. I can't remember any of these not being good, actually. And so yeah, every, everything in this was really interesting, really good, and I read it very quickly because it was so engrossing. So I'm very glad that I read this, and I'm really happy that I just stumbled across an actual, like, original hardcover edition of this at a used bookstore last year, I think. 
Um, I was stunned to actually see a copy of it because I think that it's out of print or this edition of it is relatively rare. So it was good stuff. At some point I'll actually read her novels, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. As is pretty typical for me with this particular readathon in past years, um, I didn't necessarily read any five-star new-to-me books. I mean, like, I, I love the Murder Bot novels, but I read them before. Um, but it's a good way for me to get some more things off of my physical TBR, get through some books pretty quickly, and I don't know, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the intensity of the week-long readathon where I read like one book per day. So I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to go see if I have any more cough drops left in the house and go sit in front of that fan. Let me know if you've read any of these books. If you have any thoughts on them, leave me some comments down below because I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, bye.